Hello and welcome to our third virtual Johnson County Master Gardeners Continuing Education Program. I am Doug Garretts. Today I'm pleased to introduce Deb Walser, who will be discussing how to prepare for possible drought conditions. The timing of Deb's presentation is actually perfect. Recently, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration released its official spring outlook forecasting an expanding drought with a drier than normal planting season for much of the country and nearly all of the continental United States is looking at warmer than normal spring temperatures. Now a little more about Deb. The first time Deb was sent to her grandmother's gardens to pick raspberries, eating more than she brought back, she was hooked. Gardening was her thing. In high school, she took care of the school greenhouse, setting up experiments for the teachers. These days, a terrific day, rain or shine, is spent working in her garden until the mosquitoes bite. Professionally, Deb works, worked at Peck's Garden Center in Cedar Rapids 24 years as a perennial specialist. Currently, she has found a new home at Pearson's West. Deb has been a master gardener in Lynn County since 1995. You may have heard her on WMT 600 AM Sunday mornings from eight to nine, or at the Winter Gardening Fair in Lynn County. Welcome, Deb. The screen. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. And I'm gonna go ahead and share my PowerPoint with you. No, well, maybe I'm not. There we go. Can you see my screen? Doug, can you see this? Okay, you can see. Okay, this um, presentation I wrote in, in 2013 after hearing a presentation done by a friend of mine who said, we're gonna have a drought or we just had a drought, we're not gonna plant anything. And I thought, oh no, as gardeners, we always plant, we'll push the envelope no matter what. So I put together this um, presentation because I know that we as gardeners, we're gonna garden no matter if it's a drought or not. But this actually is um, a, a really, um, you know, as, I, as Doug said, a timely presentation because we are talking a lot about uh, drought and possibly the Western, even now, the Western part of the state is in a drought position where we, you know, because of the rain we've gotten, it's not quite so bad for the for Eastern Iowa right now. Um, this is actually my lake in Minnesota. We've got a cabin in Minnesota, and that's the lake. Yeah. So how? Yeah. Can, yes. I'm not seeing your slides. Not seeing my slides. Nope. I see. I see my slides. Okay. Here, we'll, uh, we'll do it this way. Got it. There a little better? Go. Better. Yeah, a little better, okay. Okay, that's the lake, that's, a, that's the cabin. So we'll go here. How can we save water? These are the areas we're gonna start by talking. A lot of us know this, it's, it's just common sense, but we're gonna kind of go over what we, how we waste water in the outdoor and the indoor. Okay. So indoor use, 60% of all our residential use are used in this way. Nearly 40% is a toilet. 
Toilets had three and a half gallons per flush. Showers and faucets combine 60% of all of our indoor water use. More than 4.8 billion gallons of water is flushed down the toilet every day. We can save in the bathroom. While brushing our teeth or shaving, turn off the water. Take shorter showers. You got to work on my husband with that one. Off while soaping, so you got your power saving. Um, they, there's a power saving head that you can actually turn off when you're just soaping up and install the low flow shower heads. Toilets can only be used to carry away solid waste instead of every time you flush. Saving in the kitchen, run the dishwasher only when it's full. Fill a sink or dishpan with water to rinse or wash. Five and the, uh, bleh, hold on. An open faucet lets about five gallons of water every two minutes. So if you're rinsing off your dishes before you put them in the dishwasher, you're losing five gallons for every two minutes. Saving outdoors, about 32% of the water use is outside. Washing a car, 150 gallons of water by turning the hose off between rinses. Wash on the lawn. You'll be able to water your lawn at the same time that you're reducing runoff. Cleaning sidewalks on the hot driveways. Hose uses about 50 gallons of water every five minutes. Solution, sweep instead of hosing them down. Use an air hose or use a leaf blower. Saving on our lawn care. Water early in the morning. Water on cooler days to reduce evaporation. Uh, that late evening thing, don't do that. Don't, don't water it in late evening because that just encourages fungus and, and other types of things to grow. Allow your grass to grow taller. Well, I don't mow my grass any lower than three inches. That provides shade for the roots and then helps hold the water in. <clears throat> this saves more than 50% of your water usage. Highest priority, this is a list that was um, developed by um, the Cedar Rapids when they were talking about um, rationing water. And they said that the highest priority would be newly planted trees and shrubs and perennials. We're gonna have a lot of newly planted trees in, in the Cedar Rapids area because of the ratio. So that would be the first priority is to water them. Second priority would be in seeded lawns or repaired lawn areas. That also is something because of the duration that Cedar Rapids is having to do because of all of the trees that were on our boulevards waiting to be picked up has really damaged a lot of that boulevard area. Plants on sandy or windy soils or exposed sites. That's your last priority is to do the sandy or windy areas um, as far as what the Cedar Rapids was thinking about rationing water. And then you've got your ve vegetables. And then, yeah, that's, a, that's the last priority. We've got 11 ways to save on watering and some of these are gonna come, come as a real shock to you guys. Like my first one, kill the grass. Grass is one of the highest um, usage of water and chemicals, etc. Mulch or compost. You can use compost as a mulch. It's going to hold 10 times more water than plain old soil is. Water manually. Automated sprinklers. The soaker hose. Collecting rainwater and rain barrels. Divert in the rainwater, build rain gardens, plant in groups and elevate, and plant in terraces. So first of all, kill the lawn. Lawns are high maintenance. Eliminate your lawn, retain only enough of a large enough patch for you to sit on or lounge on. Drain the lawn to be tough by withholding water until you see signs of it wilting. Plant the yard with shrubs and ornamental plants and drought tolerant perennials. 
most of way, most efficient ways of conserving water is mulch. Mulch will smother weeds, hold in water, and prevents evaporation. It also biodegrades naturally. Um, rock is not mulch. It's not organic. Um, the, but your uh, mulch will biodegrade and add nutrients and soil to your plantings. So when I add mulch every year, spread two to three inches of organic material on top of the soil and between the plants. This also would go for compost. You can put compost as a, because it's gonna hold in 10 times more water than the natural soil would. So putting compost as a mulch, it works really well too. Watering manually is the most efficient irrigation system we have in the garden is, is to water by hose. Surprised? Think about it. Direct water to the root zone. Watering each plant counts up, up to 20. This is what I tell my mother to do when I plant something. And she says, well, how much do I water it? And I says, you count to 20. You go to the next plant, count to 20 again. Go to the last plant, count to 20 again. And then go back to the first plant and count to 20 again by repeating the cycle. That way, and she also wants to have her hose at half strength, not full strength. So the plant has a, time, a chance to really get that into that newly planted root zone. Water is wasted by May watering in the middle of the day. Why is that? Because it evaporates. Water early in the morning, because that way we get the, the coolness, it's cooler, and you're not having to, um, you're not inviting fungus to move into your plants. Automated sprinklers. Drip irrigation is one of the most efficient automated sprinkler systems. Um, it waters with the ground between the plants. A network of narrow punctured tubes drip water into the soil surface at the base of the plants. If you're not using a drip system, you can still get more efficiency with micro spray heads. And that's the bottom picture is the micro spray head. Also, turn off your irrigation when, you're, when it's raining. I don't know how many times I've seen the um, uh, sprinkler systems on and it's pouring down rain and the, and the sprinklers are on. It's a terrible waste of water. This is a poor man's low pressure drip system. This is something I put in my raised beds. I'm going to give you a list of the parts on how to build this. I started off with, with a 1T, four elbows, an X, male and female hose ends, and male or female, and a long pipe. And you can see at the bottom, I dry fitted the pieces. The piece that is right here is one of those quick, quick connects, so I can quickly connect my hoses to these, uh, this um, uh, poor, man, poor man's irrigation system by hooking it up to my hose or I hook it up to my um, rain barrels. So how I did this at first is I clamped a piece in the, into place, making sure that the red writing here was on the side was because I'm gonna drill a hole straight through, straight through, uh, all is straight down, straight through. At every four inches, I put a hole in this pipe and my, my um, Writing is on the side, so you won't see it when you turn it onto its side and putting it together. I used a 1 16th drill bit for this. Then I glued it all together. And again, you can see that quick connect down on this end here and put it in my garden. This day, at this point, picture here, I had it actually uh, above the ground, um, just uh, on some pieces of metal, and they call them stringers. That's how I make my raised beds. So I use stringers and that guy that gets it a little bit off the ground before I started planting. The rest of the time it just lays right in my garden um, and it waters to, but to both sides of each of the poles. Soaker hoses. Hand watering can be time consuming. That's why we don't do the hose. Splinter, sprinklers wet the foliage then fungus can de develop. Water seeps out of the soaker hoses right to your plant's roots. 
Soak our hoses, waste less water. Are best used in a garden beds where plants are relatively close together. Water 30 minutes twice a week. The, the, the statement about relatively close together, I planted uh, a shrub row and instead of putting a uh, soaker hose there, I made a poor man soaker hose, which I took a piece of, of garden hose, wrapped it around the bleach of the plants like you see here, and then I would um, uh, poke a hole in, the, in that soaker hose or in that old piece of hose, and then I had my soaker hose, and it was only getting the plants wet at, right at the root zone instead of everything in between. So that's another way to do it. Okay, collecting rainwater. I have nine rain barrels and I collect rainwater and use rainwater a lot because it's, it's, it's free. Um, I can use it for landscaping and other things. There is a little bit of an, uh, an issue about using rainwater for vegetable beds, but it's such a, a small thing. I don't really worry about it too much. I hook up my rain barrel to my drip irrigation or to the soaker hoses. And I've got a little faucet. This faucet is way too high on this one. You see where that is? You're only gonna get 25 gallons of water out of that barrel because the hose is way up the top. The bottom hose may be running to a soaker, a soaker hose or something like that. I love rain barrels. And you can save on your water bill. That's always a good thing. This is a, ty a type of barrel system that I saw out online. And I decided that that made a lot of sense for me because I've got a three story deck and under the story of the deck, the stairs. And I was able to build something very similar to this by using the, the upside down bung power. This is a bung plug and you can use a two, a two by or two by two to open it up or you can do that. But you can see I drilled out the, this part here and I screwed on, because there, there happens to be um, threading there, a, a t adapter to go to my hoses. And this is, uh, this is what they look like all set up, ready to go. You know, I've got uh, an L, the screwed into the bunge, an elbow, oops. Yeah, there's an elbow, a second elbow, and then between these two, there's going to be a pipe running between these two. I also put these shutoff valves on, so maybe I didn't want all of the barrels to be filled up, so I can do the shutoff valve on each of the, each in between each one. And there's, there's what it looks like when it's all plumbed and ready to go and I'm able to hook up my hose. I've got one on my top deck, one on my middle deck, and one on the east uh, west corner of my house, and one on the east corner of my house, and then the five that are underneath. So I've got oh, about 900 gallons worth of water at any given time. Another way is to divert your rainwater. You can uh, actually divert it by making a little path you can use tile, um, any, you can attach a, a sprinkler or soaker hose to, to those and move them around to different parts of the yard. This is a good way to water large trees whose water needs that may or may not be um, served by the light rains. And we had a maple tree in our front yard, still have half of a maple tree in our front yard that's gonna need more water because it, it used to have such a huge canopy that the water didn't get through when it was pouring down rain. Not so much anymore. This is also a good way to water rain gardens. Why do a rain garden? It allows rainwater to run off and the opportunity to soak into the ground. It filters through the soil layers before entering the underground water system, the, the ferro, ferro thing. It improves the water quality in bodies of water. So we're not having runoff. Cut down the amount of pollution reaching the creeks and streams. And use most of the natural rain and snow that falls on a property, which is why I use my rain barrels for the most part. I do have a rain garden 
This is not my rain garden, but this is a wonderful rain garden. I, I attended a, a seminar at Iowa State about rain gardens, and the gentleman was talking about how you can put how he did like a comparison of two newly constructed streets side by side, and they put rain gardens on one street, and then just put the regular. Um, sewer system on the other side or water system on the other street and they saw an 80 percent reduction in the amount of water that was going down the storm sewers with the rain garden street versus the street that didn't have rain gardens and rain gardens don't have to be ugly they don't have to be natural uh, or they don't have to be all native you can do a lot of things with plants that are non-native or and then hybrid, like the black-eyed Susans here and the Russian sage and the ornamental grasses. So you wanna collect this in low areas, specifically planted with water lovers. Water lovers are like lobelia and iris and oh, joe pie weed. There's a uh, um, goat's spear. There's a lot of different plants that would like to have wet feet for a short period of time. It's especially handy if you already have a low area in your yard. I do, I've got a swamp land in my backyard. Uh, you can divert water from your gutters. You saw the diverting way of diverting, whether you do a fancy brick thing with, with pea gravel in it, or you tile it to, to that area, or just uh, to dig a, a trench that will divert your water from your yard and downspouts into this rain garden. Rain garden will will sleep, the, the rainwater will seep slowly into the soil watering those plants. We want to make sure we plant in groups, groups according to their need for water and sun. You want to set aside a bed and a part of the bed for any thirsty plants that's close to where you're watering so you can confine all your watering to one spot. Keep shade lovers with other shade lovers and sun lovers where they can bask in the heat. Elevate your garden's beds. This happens to be my raised beds and I've elevated my garden beds. So I'm not actually using the soil that is already there. You've set your garden on top of the ground. Um, besides saving my back, raised beds have three benefits. Water congregates around the plants rather than running out in the garden. Raised beds provide, provide excellent drainage and raised beds also mean better circulation for your plants so you can get away from any of the diseases. Um, my rain gardens with a special soil there, or my elevated garden beds, very rarely need water. And if they do, I've got that fancy irrigation system to put in. On a hilly area or sloped area, we wanna build terraces. Um, edged in stone or bricks or tiles, just about anything that you would like to have it edged in, simply by mounting little ridges of stones around to hold the plants in place. You can install a new plant, dig a little moat. You put your mulch on it and you dig a moat around where the, the root ball is, so water will congregate in that moat and soak into that newly planted root, root ball. The moat will melt into the garden surface, helping then plants grow deeper. So as the moat disintegrates, it's going to become part of the soil around it. Deep roots help plants to use all the available water. So we want to water to make these plants tougher by only watering when they need it, not as we want to do it. So here's the water-wise garden plants. When installing any plant, keep the soil moist during its first year. So it will have deep roots and take advantage of the, every drop of moisture. The plants that well, after they're established, you'll be able to tell when they need, need water. They'll have a pale, color, a pale color, drooping leaves and stems, and something like that. Blazing Star is a native, and this one is very easy to grow. I'm not gonna read the information there because you can get, read that yourself. But butterflies and hummingbirds, this actually blooms from the top to the bottom, which gives you a really long um, bloom season from four to six weeks in July. Penstemon is also another native called Beard's Tongue. 
and it's a wild flower. It comes in lots and lots of different colors. Um, most recently, we've seen a lot with a with a burgundy um, foliage on it, with the yellows and or the blues and the purples and the lavenders, and dark red. It blooms for lots of weeks. Yucca is another native plant that um, thrives in the hot, hot sun. My sister just moved to Arizona and she's doing a whole backyard in yucca because it's the only thing that grows in Arizona. Purple coneflower. There's a lot of different purple coneflowers out there. The new cultivars tend to be not quite as invasive. They have sterile seed varieties. Um, this is the common um, purple coneflower, the native variety. And he's going to spread aggressively, and um, it's really quite nice to leave his seed heads on all winter long. And the goldfinch and the birds will spread the seeds for you. Sage is another one, and also is called salvia. Uh, there's a lot of salvias in the nurseries, to, from from white to pink to lavender to purple, uh, and it's just a wonderful plant. Um, it is deer resistant. It doesn't need to have much pruning done to it. So it's really, really nice. Uh, water them the first year and let, leave them alone after that. They handle the neglect really well. Sunflowers, there are annual sunflowers and there are perennial sun, uh, sunflowers. Um, this one here is an annual one and dozens of flowers. So what's really neat about the sunflower is that it follows the sun. So in the, when, it's, when the sun is coming up, it's gonna be facing east. When the sun is going down, it's gonna be facing west. Uh, there's fields of this up in Northern Minnesota and it's just fascinating to see which way they're being pointed. Lots of them are really uh, are perennial too. Wild petunia, this old common old uh, purple petunia does really, really well, it self seeds itself. <laughs> and it, it will um, bloom most of the summer and it attracts hummingbirds, it attracts butterflies. It's just a really nice and common petunia. The ice plant is native to a really, really dry area and it has a succulent type leaf to it and really, really brilliant flowers of orange and purple and red and lots of different colors of the succulents. But because it's got these fleshy succulent leaves, it holds water really, really well. This actually came from the, the mountain areas like Colorado and Montana. German iris. German iris like it really dry. They don't require a lot of water. Um, every once in a while, you might have to divide them. But the German iris will, will survive very, very well, unlike the Siberian iris that would like to be in that rain garden. Purple poppies, these are uh, the purple poppy mallow and it's a really nice, cute little flower. It comes out, out from its base and just um, you know dances in the wind. It's really a nice thing from Texas and New England. The false indigos are native also and there's a lot of different colors of false indigos, anywhere from three to five feet tall and that equally is one. Their blue-green foliage and, and, and deep colored flowers. You, if you don't cut the flowers, they get a black seed pod in late fall. This is actually used by the Native Americans. That was a baby rattle, that back seed pod. And the purple was used uh, in their costumes for the purple dye that would, they would put in the things. One of the things with, with false indigo is you don't move it. You pick a spot and you leave it because it forms very, very deep root systems. Got a tap root on it. Um, when we moved into my, the house that we're in right now, 25 years ago, there was one right at the bottom of the steps and I knew my kids were gonna run right through it. So I moved it six feet away from where it was. It took three years for it to bloom. So if you're gonna move it, you understand that it may not bloom for about three, three years after that. Um, you'll get three, three to six weeks of bloom out of the, the um, false indigo. Very, very pretty. And with that blue green foliage, it's something different than just green. 
Ornamental grasses, we know that ornamental grasses will put down root systems that could go six to 10 feet down. So we wanna make sure that, the, that we give them enough water to establish. And once they're established, there's very little care. Um, every spring, I take my bungee cords out, I wrap my grasses up, and I take my hedge clipper and I cut all my grasses down to, the, down to six inches. But if we got, you know, again, these are gonna go very, very deep. Put them where you want them because you're not going to want to dig them up. Uh, digging up often involves, um, oh, I don't know. I pulled one out with a minivan and a chain once. Uh, I think that I should have used a backhoe. Newly England aster. There's a lot of different asters. Again, they can be anywhere from three to six feet tall. And this is a fall plant, blooming plant. It's a late summer. It's about the same time that the mums are blooming. It's very, very nice. Um, I tend to pinch mine back, or if the deer don't do it, I'll cut them back about to half the height that they are, so they bloom a little later, and they're a little more compact. So when that six-foot stem gets up there, it gets kind, of, gets kind of floppy. So this is a way to develop our garden according to water-wise principles. You'll be replayed many times over by conserving water, saving money, and saving time and labor. Um, one of the things that I did is several years ago is I had a meter put in for just my outside watering, which has saves me the um, amount of um, storm sewer uh, um, price because I, and I think that thing paid for itself in three years. So now all of my hoses are attached to a water wise meter. These are my resources. I use the Extension University of Illinois for a lot of information. A couple articles by, that I found um, for the University of Minnesota and uh, 16 water-wise plants for, by Marilyn Lewis. There are so many water-wise plants, but I think that the biggest thing is, is that we plant and we let them establish themselves and then they are basically maintenance free. You want to talk, have a Master Gardener speak at your event, you can call the Master Gardeners at 447-0647. You can email them at lincountymastergardener at gmail.com. We have a Facebook page that has lots of information on it, website for Lynn County Extension, and of course, WMT Radio, 600 yeah, from 8 o'clock to 9 o'clock. This is my backyard. And I do have grass. My husband um, insisted on having enough grass that we could play, throw a ball to the kids and he didn't have to go in the neighbor's yard to get it. But up in this area up here are my gardens. And there are my gardens. You see my web, my email on top. If you'd like a copy of this program, you can give me a PDF and I will send you a PDF. Tell me which program that you'd like a copy of and I'll send it as a PDF to you. And that's my backyard with my raised beds. And any questions? Thank you, Deb. <laughs> that's a beautiful backyard. I enjoy it a lot. We do have some questions that have come in through the chat box. Um, actually, a couple of them are mine. So what is the issue of using rainwater for vegetable beds? There was a, a, a 2018, no, it was even when it was like a 2013 article from New Jersey um, discussing that if birds poop on our roof or animals poop on our roof, that, that, will, that would contaminate the water. And there's a slight risk of E. coli and some of those other things. So again, if we're not watering, if we're watering our plants at the base like we're supposed to, the E. coli shouldn't be an issue. You know, and it was such a small issue. And I have seen no, no problems since then or articles since then that talk about rainwater not being okay to use on your vegetables. So you don't, you don't use rainwater to water vegetables or, and you don't recommend it? No, I do, I do water uh, with rainwater. I do water my vegetables. It's just that there is a slight um, problem with the rainwater. 
Um, I've been rain, doing uh, rainwater um, most of the time. I do from the rain barrels because yeah, I, I try to save money by not using my outside um, watering system. But if I can use the rainwater, I'll use rainwater first. Um, and I haven't seen any problems with, you know, the, the, you get some sludge that builds up in the bottom of my barrels, but you know, that's okay too. You know, they were, it works fine. Follow up question to that. It looks like uh, Jane has sent a question. I've heard rainwater from asphalt roof may have chemicals. It, it may have some chemicals, but it's not chemicals that, that are damaging. You know, things uh, like arsenic, are naturally occurring in our soil. A lot of the chemicals that um, come from an asphalt are naturally occurring in our soil. So it's really not a danger. You know, uh, I know that the, the food bank, who I attended a seminar in the food bank, and ne they never ask you if you've used rainwater or, or barrel water to water your plants. They are not concerned with it, so we shouldn't be either. Okay. Okay. Uh, this question is from Connie Gobe. I, I'm probably mispronouncing that last name. Do you have to drain your water barrels in the winter, fall, winter seasons? I don't. I, I, I just disconnect them from the gutter system just by moving the gutter system out of the way so there's not any more water going in them. But I have not had a cracked barrel or anything else. I just leave the water there. In fact, I just emptied it because I put new carpet on my deck and I had to move the rain barrel all the way and it was completely thawed. Okay. Another question from me. Uh, don't raised beds dry out a lot faster, uh, therefore need to be watered more frequently? No, they dry out. They dry out nicely. In fact, that's why I'm able to plant right now is because they warm up faster. But because of the soil mixture of using compost, vermiculite, and sphagnum peat moss, that's a really nice loose soil and it holds the water better than plain old ground soil does. So you really have an amended soil in your raised beds, not right, your... right. With a raised bed, you can put it right on top of your icky clay soil, and put the new soil on the top. Um, in Cedar Rapids here, we can go to Blue Stem and get compost for free. For the bottom, I mean, most of my beds are are 18 inches tall, so the bottom 10 inches I've got uh, Cedar Rapids compost, and then I mix the top with the vermiculite, the sphagnum, and the compost. Okay. Yep. But that's a, that's a whole nother, that's a whole nother talk on raised beds. <laughs> okay. Uh, this question is from Linda Schreiber. How should we address dry conditions for rain gardens? Well, you're gonna have to supplement rain, if, uh, put some succulent, but it really a rain garden is nothing better than a regular garden. It just holds the moisture when it does rain, but those plants, the grasses, the joe pie, the black-eyed susans, they grow just fine with, with the dropped positions. And of course, it's always the survival of the fittest with the plants. You know, the ones that can tolerate the wet and dry, is this rain garden isn't going to be like my backyard where you sink to the ankle because I've got, I've got underground springs that water my backyard, now the lower part of my backyard, and it's very wet. But that water is not going to be in your rain garden. It's not going to be there, standing there for weeks on end. It's going to be soaked into and back down to the aquifer down, down below. So it's a really good use of uh, rainwater. Okay. Uh, this next question is from Shannon Balicki. Are there filter systems you could add to eliminate debris or other concerns? And this I'm assuming is- yeah, rain The rain barrels. Yes, there, there are filter systems that you can add to your downspout to get that. Um, I have a basket that is mesh on one of my rain barrels. And I just have to go and clean that out every once in a while, but that keeps a lot of the debris from falling into the rain basket or the, into the rain barrel. So there are several different things that you can do. Um, in, in big cities, they actually, or, or people that are really doing this, 
Um, a friend of mine went to Australia and they were talking about Australian rain barrels and rain barrels in Australia are the size of a large room because they really need to conserve their water and they have filter systems to make it so they can actually drink it. We don't drink our rainwater here. Not if it's gone into a barrel. Okay. It's, not that easy. it's just not, it doesn't taste good and I don't think it's a little bit too dirty. So we don't want to do that. Okay. Okay. Um, I, that's all the questions we've had come in through the chat, uh, unless anyone else has something they're ready to submit. I don't see anything else coming in, Deb. Okay. So. Well, thanks for having me here. Thank you for that presentation. I've got a little bit here before we wrap up. Um, again, thank you for your informative presentation. You're welcome. Uh, let's also thank Shannon Balicki for hosting our education ses session presentation and Iowa City's City Channel 4 for live streaming and recording this presentation. If you have gardening questions, don't forget our Hort line. Although we aren't in the office, our volunteers are answering questions. Call the Hort line at 337-2145. That's 337-2145. Or send us an email at Johnson County, that's C-O, Master Gardeners. So it's Johnson, C-O-M-G, all one word, at gmail.com. If you are interested in participating in our 2021 Seed Share program, send us an email with a with 2021 Seed Share in the subject line. Our email address again is Johnson, C-O-M-G, at gmail.com. If you are interested in participating in future Johnson County Master Gardening continuing education sessions, please look for those in the Times newsletter or watch our Facebook page for information. Thank you for joining us. Have a great afternoon, everyone. <laughs>